Think Forward. Think Research Channel. It's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're manic, even the UCLA Medical Center has a certain appeal. The hospital, ordinarily a cold clotting of uninteresting buildings, became for me that fall morning not quite 20 years ago, a focus of my finely wired, exquisitely alert nervous system. With vibrissae twinging, antennae perked, eyes fast forwarded and fly faceted, I took in everything around me. I was on the run. Not just on the run, but fast and furious on the run, darting back and forth across the hospital parking lot, trying to use up a boundless, restless, manic energy. I was running fast, but slowly going mad. The man I was with, a colleague from the medical school, had stopped running an hour earlier and was, he said impatiently, exhausted. This, to a saner mind, would not have been surprising. The usual distinction for the two of us had disappeared, and the endless hours of scotch, brawling, and fallings about in laughter had taken an obvious, if not final, toll. We should have been sleeping or working, publishing, not perishing, reading journals, writing in charts, or drawing tedious scientific graphs that no one else would read. Suddenly, a police car pulled up. Even in my less than totally lucid state, I could see that the officer had his hand on his gun as he got out of the car. What in the hell are you doing running around the parking lot at this hour, he asked. A not unreasonable question. My few remaining islets of judgment reached out to one another and linked up long enough to conclude that this particular situation was going to be hard to explain. My colleague, fortunately, was thinking far better than I was and managed to reach down into some deeply intuitive part of his own and the world's collective unconscious and said, we're both on the faculty in the psychiatry department. <laughs> the policeman looked at us, smiled, went back to his car squad car and drove away. <laughs> Being professors of psychiatry explained everything. Within a month, of signing my appointment papers to become an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of California at Los Angeles, I was well on my way to madness. Within three months, I was manic beyond recognition and just beginning a long, costly, personal war against a medication that I would, in a few years' time, be strongly encouraging others to take. My illness and my struggle against the drug that ultimately saved my life and restored my sanity had been years in the making. For as long as I can remember, I was frighteningly, although often wonderfully, beholden to moods. Intensely emotional as a child, mercurial as a young girl, first severely depressed as an adolescent, and then unrelentingly caught up in the cycles of manic depression by the time I began my professional life. I became, both by necessity and intellectual inclination, a student of moods. It has been the only way I know to understand and indeed to accept the illness I have. It has also been the only way I know to try and make a difference in the lives of others who also suffer from mental illness. The disease that has on several occasions 
nearly killed me, does kill thousands and tens of thousands of people every year. Most are young, and most die utterly unnecessarily. But my manias, at least in their early and mild forms, were absolutely intoxicating states that gave rise to great personal pleasure, an incomparable flow of thoughts, and a ceaseless energy that allowed the translation of new ideas into papers and projects. Medications not only cut into these fast-flowing, high-flying times, they also brought with them seemingly intolerable side effects. It took me far too long to realize that lost years and relationships cannot be recovered. The damage done to oneself and to others cannot always be put right again. And that the freedom from the control imposed by medication loses its meaning when the only alternatives are death and insanity. But the war that I waged against myself is not an uncommon one. The major clinical problem in treating manic depression is not that there are not effective medications, there are but the patients so often refuse to take them. Worst yet, because of a lack of information, poor medical advice, the terrible stigma, or a fear of personal and professional reprisals, they do not seek treatment at all. Manic depression distorts moods and thoughts, incites dreadful behaviors, destroys the basis of rational thought, and too often erodes the desire and will to live. It is an illness that is biological, genetic, and its origins, yet one that feels psychological in the experience of it. An illness that is unique in conferring advantage and pleasure, yet one that brings in its wake almost unendurable suffering and, far too frequently, suicide. I am fortunate that I have not died from my illness. Fortunate in having received the best medical care available and fortunate in having the friends, colleagues, and family that I do. Because of this, I have in turn tried as best as I could to use my own experiences of the disease to inform my research, teaching, clinical practice, and advocacy work. I had many concerns about publicly discussing my own attacks of mania, depression, and psychosis, as well as acknowledging my problems with the need for ongoing medication. Clinicians have been, for obvious reasons, of licensing and hospital privileges, reluctant to make their psychiatric problems known to others. These concerns are well warranted. I had no idea what the long-term consequences of discussing such issues so openly would be on my personal and professional life. But whatever the consequences, they were bound to be better than continuing to be silent. I was tired of hiding, tired of misspent and knotted energies, tired of the hypocrisy, and tired of acting as though I had something to hide. One is what one is, and the dishonesty of hiding behind a degree or title or any manner and collection of words is still exactly that, dishonest. Necessary, perhaps but dishonest. I continue to have concerns about my having been public about my illness, for a lot of good reasons. Uh, but one of the advantages of having had manic depressive illness for as long as I have, for so many years, is that very little else seems insurmountably difficult. Much like crossing the Bay Bridge when there's a storm over the Chesapeake, one may be terrified to go forward but there is no question of going back. I find myself somewhat inevitably taking a certain solace in Robert Lowell's essential question. Yet, why not say what happened? Writing and talking in a personal way about manic depression began for me with teaching. For years, I had been director of the Mood Disorders Clinic at UCLA. And it had soon become clear to me and to the other faculty in the clinic that the residents and interns were not exactly on intimate terms with the subjective experience of manic depression or its treatments. Diagnosis, yes. Which drugs to prescribe, yes. Well, generally, yes. <laughs> Look, 
often equivocally, yes. But what the psychiatric illness actually felt like to those who had it, no. So I would like to read two brief passages that I wrote many years ago now, anonymously, of course, for the psychiatric residents and other trainees in our clinic. The first is sort of a thumbnail sketch of one person's experience of manic depression. There is a particular kind of pain, elation, loneliness, and terror involved in this kind of madness. When you're high, it's tremendous. The ideas and feelings are fast and frequent like shooting stars, and you follow them until you find better and brighter ones. Shyness goes. The right words and gestures are suddenly there. The power to captivate others a felt certainty. There are interests found in uninteresting people. Feelings of ease, intensity, power, well-being, financial omnipotence, and euphoria pervade one's marrow. But somewhere, this changes. The fast ideas are far too fast, and there are far too many. Overwhelming confusion replaces clarity. Memory goes. Humor and absorption on friends' faces are replaced by fear and concern. Everything previously moving with the grain is now against. You are irritable, angry, frightened, uncontrollable, and enmeshed totally in the blackest caves of the mind. You never knew those caves were there. It will never end, for madness carves its own reality. It goes on and on, and finally there are only others' recollections of your behaviors, your bizarre, frenetic, aimless behaviors. For mania has at least some grace in partially obliterating memory. What then, after the medications, the psychiatrist, despair, depression, and nearly lethal overdose? All those incredible feelings to sort through. Who is being too polite to say what? Who knows what? What did I do? Why? And most hauntingly, when will it happen again? Then, too, are the bitter reminders. Medicine to take, resent, forget. Take, resent, and forget, but always to take. Credit cards revoked, bounce checks to cover, explanations do at work, apologies to make, friendships gone or drained, a ruined marriage. And always, when will it happen again? Which of my feelings are real? Which of the me's is me? The wild, impulsive, chaotic, energetic, and crazy one? Or the shy, withdrawn, desperate, suicidal, doomed, and tired one? Probably a bit of both, hopefully much that is neither. Virginia Woolf, in her dives and climbs, said it all. How far do our feelings take their color from the dive underground? I mean, what is the reality of any feeling? I wrote for the residents and interns as well about the difficulties in taking medication because many of the young doctors found it simply incomprehensible and infuriating that patients would stop taking drugs that so clearly worked and saved lives and helped to stop such a devastating illness. I titled this one, Rules for the Gracious Acceptance of Lithium into Your Life. One, clear out the medicine cabinet before guests arrive for dinner or new lovers stay the night. Two, remember to put the lithium back into the cabinet the next day. Three, don't be too embarrassed by your lack of coordination or your inability to do well the sports you once did with such ease. Four, learn to laugh about spilling coffee having the palsied signature of an 80-year-old, and being unable to put on cufflinks in fewer than 10 minutes. Five, this is an occupational hazard of teaching in a psychiatry department. Smile when people joke about how they think they, quote, need to be on lithium. This generally means in a group of, generally a rather obsessive profession, that somebody felt really good that day, and they would say, gee, I think I need to be on lithium. 
Uh, if you're actually on lithium, <laughs> it loses its appeal. <laughs> Six, nod intelligently and with conviction when your physician explains to you the many advantages of lithium and leveling out the chaos in your life. Seven, be patient when waiting for this leveling off. Very patient. Reread the book of Job. Continue being patient. Contemplate the similarity between the phrases being patient and being a patient. Eight, try not to let the fact that you can't read without effort annoy you. Be philosophical. Even if you could read, you wouldn't remember most of it anyway. Nine, accommodate to a certain lack of enthusiasm and bounce that you once had. Try not to think about all the wild nights you once had. Probably best not to have had those nights anyway. <laughs> it's absolutely not true. <laughs> As sensitivity to my husband. <laughs> 10, always keep in perspective how much better you are. Everyone else certainly points it out often enough and annoyingly enough, it's probably true. 11, be appreciative of modern medicine. Don't even consider stopping your lithium. 12, when you do stop, get manic, get depressed, expect to hear two basic themes from your family, friends, and healers. But you are doing so much better, I just don't understand it. I told you this would happen. 13, restock your medicine cabinet. Like many patients, I had to deal with very bad side effects from my medication because when I was first put on medication, which was a long time ago, uh, people were kept at very high doses of lithium. I'm at much lower doses now and I really don't have any side effects at all. But at that time, in order to both manage my illness and because that was the practice of medicine at the time, um, I had very, very bad side effects that were quite debilitating. Uh, that's not the case now. I think there are really many alternatives, fortunately. But in my initial years, it was, it was difficult for me and my cohort, as they say in the trade. Um, I also missed my euphoric highs. Fortunately, I had the benefit of superb psychotherapy as well as lithium. And I think that one of the things I try in teaching over and over again to do is to point out that mania is in fact an addictive state, not just psychologically addictive, but when the, I'm sure when the biology is worked out, it will be shown to be a, you are in effect addicted to your own brain, to a substance in your own brain. It's a highly addictive state for many patients. Let me describe the beginning of one manic episode. It was a trip I took to Saturn unaccompanied by spacecraft. People go mad in idiosyncratic ways. Perhaps it was not surprising that as a meteorologist's daughter, I found myself in that glorious illusion of high summer days, gliding, flying, now and again lurching through cloud banks and ethers, past stars, and across field banks of ice crystals. Even now, I can see in my mind's rather peculiar eye an extraordinary shattering and shifting of light, in constant but ravishing colors laid out across miles of circling rings, and the almost imperceptible, somehow surprisingly pallid moons of this Catherine wheel of a planet. I saw and experienced that which had been only dreams or fitful fragments of aspiration. Was it real? Well, of course not, not in any meaningful sense of the word real. But did it stay with me? Absolutely. Long after my psychosis cleared and the medications took hold, it became part of what one remembers forever, surrounded by an almost Proustian melancholy. Long since that extended voyage of my mind and soul, Saturn and its icy rings took on an extraordinary beauty. And I don't see Saturn's image now without feeling an acute sadness that it's being so far away from me, so unobtainable in so many ways. The intensity, glory, and absolute assuredness of my mind's flight made it very difficult for me to believe once I was better, that the illness I had was one I should willingly give up. Even though I was a clinician and a scientist, and even though I could read the research literature, and indeed wrote some of it, and see the inevitable bleak consequences of not taking lithium, 
I, for many years after my initial diagnosis, was reluctant to take my medications as prescribed. Why was I so unwilling? Why did it take having to go through more episodes of mania, followed by long suicidal depressions, before I would take lithium in a medically sensible way? I have to say, when I showed this part of the manuscript to my husband, who is a hard-nosed scientist and sort of studies brains for a living and the biological psychiatrist, he said, it's very straightforward. You're, you're not only stupid, you're also stubborn. <laughs> There's a certain element of truth in that. Um, some of my reluctance, no doubt, stemmed from fundamental denial that what I had was a real disease. This is a common reaction that occurs rather counterintuitively in the wake of early episodes of mania. Moods are such an essential part of the substance of life, of one's notions of oneself, that even psychotic extremes in mood and behavior somehow can be seen as temporary even understandable reactions to what life has dealt. In my case, I had a horrible sense of loss for who I had been and where I had been. It was difficult to give up the high flights of mind and mood, even though the depressions that followed nearly cost me my life. I reaped a bitter harvest from this refusal to take lithium on a consistent basis. A floridly psychotic mania was followed inevitably by a long and lacerating black suicidal depression. It lasted more than a year and a half. From the time I woke up in the morning until the time I went to bed at night, I was unbearably miserable and seemingly incapable of any kind of joy or enthusiasm. Everything, every thought, word, movement was an effort. Everything that once was sparkling now was flat. I seemed to myself to be dull, boring, inadequate, thick-brained, unlit, unresponsive, chill-skinned, bloodless, and sparrow-drab. I doubted completely my ability to do anything well. It seemed as though my mind had slowed down and burned out to the point of being virtually useless. The wretched, convoluted, and pathetically confused mass of gray worked only well enough to torment me with a dreary litany of my inadequacies and shortcomings in character and to taunt me with the total, the desperate hopelessness of it all. What is the point in going on like this? I would ask myself. Others would say, it is only temporary. It will pass, you will get over it. But of course they had no idea how deeply I felt, though they were certainly did. Over and over and over, I would say to myself, if I can't feel, if I can't move, if I can't think, and I can't care, then what conceivable point is there in living? The morbidity of my mind was astonishing. Death and its kin were constant companions. I saw death everywhere, and I saw winding sheets and toe tags and body bags in my mind's eye. Everything was a reminder that everything ended at the charnel house. My memory always took the black line of the mind's underground system. Thoughts would go from one tormented moment of my past to the next, and each stop along the way was worse than the preceding one. My psychiatrist, who was excellent, repeatedly tried to persuade me to go into a psychiatric hospital, but I refused. I was horrified at the thought of being locked up, being away from familiar surroundings, having to attend mindless group therapy meetings, and having to put up with all of the indignities and invasions of privacy that I knew went into being on a psychiatric ward. I was working on a locked ward at the time, and I didn't relish the idea of not having the key. Mostly, however, I was concerned that if it became public knowledge that I had been hospitalized, my clinical work and privileges at best would be suspended, and at worst they would be revoked on a permanent basis. At the time, nothing seemed to be working, despite excellent medical care, and I simply wanted to die and be done with it. I resolved to kill it myself. I was cold-bloodedly determined not to give any indication of my plans or the state of my mind, and I was successful. The only note made by my psychiatrist on the day before I attempted suicide was severely depressed, very quiet. I took a massive lethal overdose of lithium, 
and antiemetics to keep it down. I was in a coma for several days and nearly died. As a result, I no longer fight taking lithium. Repeated psychosis and a nearly lethal suicide attempt have a way of convincing even the slowest of learners. And I am fortunate to have been able to take some of my own experiences into my teaching and writing. I am also enormously fortunate to have had the support of the chairman of my department when I was at UCLA, who knew from the, from the beginning, not courtesy of me, uh, unfortunately, um, that I had had a psychotic mania, and who went out of his way to reassure me, to keep me in my clinical position, keep me in my teaching position, and to say, just keep taking your lithium and learn from it, teach from it, and write from it. More recently, the chairman of my department at Johns Hopkins, um, until very recently, Paul McHugh, uh, when I went to talk to uh, Dr. McHugh and said I wanted to write a book about my ex experiences and my illness, uh, but I was reluctant to bad, bring bad publicity on Hopkins, potential law suits, whatever, you know, all the things each one imagines. And he said, you know, okay, he said, you've got it absolutely all wrong. The first chairman of surgery at Hopkins is a man named Halstead. Um, and he said, when Professor Halstead was surgeon in chief here, he said everybody on the faculty knew that Halstead was a morphine addict and a cocaine addict. And the faculty resolved that they had two obligations. The first obligation was to Professor Halstead's patients to make sure that they were not hurt by his illness. And the second was to protect Professor Halstead so that he could continue to teach and do research. He said, if Hopkins can't do that for you, Hopkins has no business being in business. Um, the week, next week after that, the president of the Hopkins Hospital called me in for lunch and said essentially the same thing, and said, if anybody gives you a bad time, send them to me. Uh, it was very wonderful. Uh, I have to say, this is in no way typical of what goes on across the United States in terms of medical schools, uh, but it is exemplary, and I am deeply appreciative for that. I would like to end with the last few pages uh, from a book I wrote. So a few observations about the complexity of an illness that is so much a part and parcel of one's temperament, but most importantly, the role of love in recovery. When I first thought about writing my book, I conceived of it as a book about moods and an illness of moods in the context of an individual life. As I wrote it, however, it somehow turned out to be very much a book about love as well. Love as sustainer, as renewer, and as protector. After each seeming death within my mind or heart, love has returned to recreate hope and to restore life. It has, at its best, made the inherent sadness of life bearable, and its beautiful and its beauty manifest. It has inexplicably and savingly provided not only cloak but lantern for the darker seasons and grimmer weather. I long ago abandoned the notion of a life without storms or a world without dry and killing seasons. Life is too complicated, too constantly changing to be anything but what it is. And I am by nature too mercurial to be anything but deeply wary of the grave unnaturalness involved in any attempt to exert too much control over essentially uncontrollable forces. There will always be propelling, disturbing elements, and they will be there until, as Lowell put it, the watch is taken from the wrist. It is, at the end of the day, the individual moments of restlessness, of bleakness, of strong persuasions, and maddened enthusiasms that inform one's life, change the nature and direction of one's work, and give final meaning and color to one's loves and friendships. Thank <laughs> you.